Welcome to The Secret of the Golden Flower. You know, sometimes I really wonder about you guys. The last two videos, I revealed the greatest secret and breakthrough in understanding in metaphysics in the last 2,000 years. And what's the response? Nah. It's like you didn't get it. And the reason you didn't get it is because of misunderstood terms. Go back and watch Matrix Learning and then the Foundation Series and understand this, Aticca Samupada. Understand what it is, how powerful it is. The process of becoming is going on all the time. Anyway. And we are caught up in it. Like, like, a piece of floatsome sucked into a whirlpool. We can't get out of it because we don't even know we're in it. <laughs> Honestly. And the thing about this is that both Buddhism and Hinduism cover it up on purpose so that people can't get free because they want customers. They want disciples. They want the public. They want people to give donations. This is the problem, and it's ultimately political. So what we have to do to go around that is to educate ourselves. Since they're not going to educate us, we have to do it for ourselves and get the benefit. So what I'm going to do now is go over in detail the process of Paticca Samuppada and how it connects the Buddha's teaching and the Vedic teachings. So where does it start? It starts from ignorance. And this ignorance is threefold. Uh, you'll see how this structure brings everything in the Buddha's teaching together in one place. It's really awesome. The threefold ignorance is love, hate, and indifference, or liking, disliking, and ignorance. Remember how we've spoke so many times about how whenever we get an impression, whenever we have an experience, whenever we get a sense perception, we immediately make a judgment. I like it, I don't like it, or I don't care. See, I like it means love. I don't like it means hatred. And I don't care means ignorance. We're simply throwing it away. We don't assign any value to it. Now, the interesting thing is a neutral perception that is unknown is normally judged as a don't like, or we hate it. So when we come across new knowledge, when we come across the unknown, we generally don't like it. Of course, that's ignorance. Because let's say our intelligence is, you know, like this, right? And then there's a whole world out here, all this stuff that we don't know, that we have never encountered before. Huh? A world of unanticipated experience. How many times does reality surprise us? A lot, right? That's unanticipated because we didn't know, we couldn't foresee, we couldn't predict. And what do we do? 
We hate it. <laughs> we reject it. We say, I don't like it. Simply because it's unknown. This, folks, is ignorance. Because, let's say, for example, Einstein. Einstein came up with the theory of relativity and transformed physics and all science, really. Now, the first thing that people said, nine times out of ten, or more than that, when they first heard Einstein's theories, that this is ridiculous, this is nonsense, this is bullshit, they hated it. Why? Because if it was true, it meant they're going to have to restructure their whole belief system. They're going to have to reevaluate everything they think is truth. They're going to have to take another look at everything. So, whenever we encounter something unanticipated, new, unknown, it could be another Einstein's theory. It could be the key to enlightenment. But if we don't know it, our tendency is, our reflex is to reject it. I don't like it. Nah, it's new. It's different. It's weird. Don't we see this everywhere? Isn't this the normal human condition? This is, Buddha got this right, you know? He got a lot of things right, but he really got this one right. So this is where it all starts. This is ignorance. Ignorance means, here's something I never heard before, I'm just going to ignore it. It's a choice. Now, it may have become such a habit that it's a reflex, but in the beginning it was a choice. It was a style. We decided, ah, I'm not going to look at any of this new stuff. I already know, I know what else. I got it, man. You know, I know about life. Ah, bullshit. I don't care. The most intelligent person you can find, their knowledge is just a tiny little drop in a great big ocean of a universe. I mean, look at these probes that scientists are sending to other planets. Every day they're uncovering something new they never, never anticipated, never thought of. <laughs> you know, how many, science, how many headlines have you seen? Scientists baffled over new discovery of this or that. They get that way. They get baffled a lot. <laughs> That's because they have this theoretical structure that's supposed to explain everything, but it doesn't. just like all of us. So, the first step is ignorance. And that leads to fabrication. Fabrication, gentil fabrication. What am I, why am I singing a stupid song? Hmm? Because we all do this. We all fabricate. And what's the main thing we fabricate? A self. I and mine. Now, I guess I'm going to have to do a video <laughs> on the Mula Pariyaya Sutta as well. Because the Mula Pariyaya Sutta describes in detail this step of fabricating the self. Briefly, how it works is <clears throat> we get a perception. We get a sense impression. We have a direct experience of the world. And then <laughs> we fabricate a series of thoughts. And we conceive of something which was not really there in the first place. And we overlay that frame on the perception of reality. This is called conceit. Huh? We say somebody's really conceited. What does it mean? They have an idea of themselves that's far different than the actual reality. Isn't that right? <laughs> so we make up this conceit of I and we project it into the object that we're perceiving. 
and then we identify with that object, and then we say, it's mine. And then we consider that object a possession and an object of enjoyment. So, in other words, it's the process of acquisition. We act, acquire this body, this mind, this identity, this self, so many objects that we want to enjoy. Huh? Or on the other, uh, the, on negative side, we try to get rid of so many things that we don't like. So this whole process of fabrication is how we build up all these false things. I, the self, the mind, civilization, corporations, religions, huh? science, all these things are fabrications. Abstractions which we have given falsely the attribute of real existence. So, fabrications are the requisite condition for the arousal of consciousness. Consciousness arises because we have fabrications, because we have an ontology, because we have a network, a system of meanings and definitions, because we have an idea of what can exist and can't exist. And funny thing, it has a lot to do with our ideas of what we like and what we don't like. <laughs> so the result is when we encounter something that we don't have a definition for, that we don't have a name and form for, it's like it's not even there. We're not conscious of it. It goes automatically into the reject bin. We miss it. So we miss our own enlightenment. We miss our own Buddhahood because we don't have a name and form. We don't have a fabrication for it. So therefore, a consciousness of it never arises. Ain't that something? So consciousness and name and form, name and form and consciousness. Huh? We become conscious of something and what's the first thing we do? We name it. This form has this name. Therefore, I am conscious of it. If we don't have a name or form for it, we'll miss it. But if we do, on the other hand, we may categorize it wrongly. For example, when we meet an enlightened person, we tend to miscategorize them. Uh, we think they're an ordinary person. We think they're operating from motives similar to our own. But we don't know the truth because the process of name and form abstracts us from the reality of direct experience into the unreality of reflective experience. Reflective and reflexive experience. But we've gone over this in early, early, early videos in this series. I think that one was in uh, Existential Ambiguity. So go back and listen to these and get these definitions. Otherwise, you won't understand what I'm trying to tell you. Huh? You'll find some fault with it. You'll criticize it out of hand. But the reality is you don't understand it. Okay, so this name and form leads to reflexive and reflective experience where we categorize things according to some system that we already have in our minds, which we call an ontology. So when we do this, of course, we make a judgment. And then that judgment leads us to the six senses. Well, why do we say six senses? Sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, and the mind. Thinking. Most of the impressions, most of the mm, encounters and manipulations that we experience are actually just in the mind. Anytime we say I, anytime we say mine, uh, it's just a thought. 
There is no reality corresponding to those thoughts. Try to understand. They are adhamma. Adhamma means that which doesn't really exist. So here we are all wound up with I and mine, mine and I. This is mine, this is yours, that one's his. Huh? And we go on and on like this. And it's all complete nonsense. <laughs> so you might say, well, why do you talk like that? I think this and I said that and I'm going to do this. Because for the sake of convenience, we use the conventional language in the ordinary way so that people can understand us at all. If we were to talk, if enlightened people or if spiritual people were to talk in Dhamma language, you wouldn't understand anything. So we have to use the conventional language, but in an unorthodox way. And this is called Dhamma language or Dhamma talk. So anyway, the six senses or our impression of having six senses is, of course, based on identification with the body. The body is the main thing that we think of as mine or I. So when the body's six senses are in operation, then we go through all the impressions that come in through those senses, categorize them, abstract them, give them names, start manipulating them with false logic. <laughs> because our Western logic with only true and false is very crippled. We've already been over the, the Buddha logic of, of uh, tetralemma and the Jain logic, which has seven truth values. And these are all superior, much, much superior forms of logic by which uh, anyone who uses them can bewilder completely a person who doesn't. Well, look at this last election, for example. Hmm? Trump blindsided everybody. He's using Jane logic. Huh? He's using apophatic, intuitional logic. I did a whole series on this called uh, Apophatic Antifragility. Huh? If you don't understand that, you're not going to ever understand how Trump won the election. There's like 27 different theories out there how he won the election. They're all wrong. <laughs> he won the election by thinking out of the box and think, running circles around the people who use linear thinking with a two-valued truth system. That's the actuality. Uh, the guy is ahead of his time. He is the Osho of politics. He done what Osho did to religion, Trump did to politics. And politics is never going to be the same. It's never going to go back in the old box. A few people are going to get what he did. And they're going to be the next wave of successful politicians. You watch and see. Remember, you heard it here first. Okay. Once the six senses are in operation, once we are perceiving things in terms of the categories of the body, then what? Contact. Uh -huh. The senses contact their objects, and then we have feelings about it. Feelings. Huh? I like it. I don't like it. I don't care. Here we go again, right? But now it's not about ideas. Now it's not about concepts. Now it's about sense perceptions. So what happens? We try to maximize the things that we like, minimize the things that we don't like, and just forget about what we don't care. And of course, in doing that, again, we throw the baby out with the bathwater. And we miss all the things that we haven't made up our minds about, that we don't have a name and form for. And that's ignorance. So what's the result of feelings? Craving. I want more of what I like. I want less of what I don't like. Craving. The whole world gets divided into two. What I want and what I don't want. People get attached. And they get attached to uh, not only the things they like, but they get very attached to the things they don't like. 
And because of that, they create lots and lots of impressions of the things they don't like, isn't it? I don't like this guy. I don't like that guy. I don't like this flavor ice cream. <laughs> It's like, it's like saying, don't think of a monkey. Huh? What happened? You thought of a monkey, didn't you? So you can say, I don't like chocolate ice cream. But what are you doing? You're thinking of chocolate ice cream. You're creating an impression of chocolate ice cream. You're bringing chocolate ice cream closer by your dislike of it. One of these days, you're going to find yourself in a room where there's nothing but chocolate ice cream. <laughs> Why? Because the process of becoming is also a process of vibrational harmony. And when you create a thought about anything, you're bringing it closer. You're bringing it within your range of experience and you're creating a body huh, that has that thing as a feature. Because what's the next thing after craving, clinging? Huh? I want what I, what I like, and I don't want what I don't like. That's clinging. This gets really obsessive. And again, it creates lots and lots and lots of mental impressions of the things we don't like. And then the process of becoming. Becoming means developing a body. Now, the body is developing in seven stages. Conception, gestation, birth, childhood, youth, old age, and death. Those seven stages go round and round and round on this process of Paticca Samupada, birth and death, the wheel of samsara. They all mean the same thing. So when you are becoming, and you're also becoming at every stage of life, the fetus is becoming the infant, the infant is becoming the child, the child is becoming the teenager, the teenager is becoming the grown-up, the grown-up is becoming the old person, and the old person is becoming dead. The dead person is becoming, again, the fetus. This is how it goes. So if we're not conscious of this process, if we don't know what we're doing, if we don't know how to manipulate or control it, we have absolutely no control over the next body. And guess what? We're going to get in the next body the mixture of impressions, the sum total of all the impressions that we generated in this life. What happens at the time of death? People say, my whole life flashed before my eyes. And what does that mean? It means that it's like a reel of tape. Remember the good old days when we had tape recorders? I do. <laughs> the first recording studio I had was in New York City. It cost over a million dollars. And it had a four a screaming Ampex four track tape recorder. <laughs> He used one inch wide tape to record four tracks at very high dynamic resolution. It was a beautiful recorder, but it required a whole, literally a whole truckload of outboard gear to get the signals in and out. Now that whole thing fits in my iPad. So anyway, in the old days, we had tape recorders, reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. And when you get to the end of the tape, you have to rewind it. And it makes a very funny sound. Huh? <laughs> Everything's speeded up. So that's what happens at the end of life. At the end of life, your whole life is rewound back onto the spool and compressed. Because there exists something called rasa. The rasa is an emotional, a metaphysical state based on emotion. So all the things that we like, all the things that we don't like, all the things that we love, all the things that we're afraid of, all the different rasas huh, are, again, 
All the impressions that we have during our life are categorized into those rasas. And those combination of tastes determine the next body. It becomes the seed of the next body, the psychic seed that gets implanted in the womb of the next mother and grows. So you see this process, Paticca Samupada. Paticca Samupada means specific causality. Huh? As a result of this, that ar arises. As a result of that, this other thing arises. And so on down the line. So because of ignorance, ignorance is the ultimate cause. Huh? This is good, this is bad, and I don't care about the rest. That fundamental distinction is the root cause of everything. And when we uh, penetrate in meditation to that root cause is when we attain final enlightenment, fourth path, our hunthood. When we go beyond that, when we see that everything is, That's the moment. So anyway, what does it mean for the sadhu? Well, the sadhu now has the tools necessary to manipulate the process of becoming in any way desired. I mean, there are certain limits. Huh? You can only change this body so much until you have to get a new one then all the limitations are removed. So, I'm really out of time. I've actually gone over time. So I'm not going to go on to the next step uh, until the following video. But uh, what it means is that a sadhu takes control of the process of becoming to make his life just the way he wants it. Once he is uh, content once he is satisfied with the life that he has got then he can go on to create any kind of existence that he likes or any kind that is uh, good for his process of self-realization in the next life that is what the process of becoming is all about